Sunday night, October 18th, 6 p.m. Bible study. I want to thank all of you for taking time tonight to log on and work with us through this Bible study. As we are coming together tonight and joining in a time of searching the Word of God, go ahead and turn in your Bible, if you brought it with you, to Luke chapter 6. Uh, tonight, primarily, we're going to look at verses 20 through 23, and then we're going to uh, put our main focus on verses 22 and 23. Uh, we're going to talk about something that I believe is very, very important for um, every one of us as believers that is our daily commitment to follow Christ. I know all of us understand that. I really believe that. If you are a born-again believer, it has not slipped your thoughts nor slipped out of your heart that we are supposed to spend our life following the teachings of Jesus, seeking our Lord in prayer, serving others as Christ served and ministered to others, using our jobs, our lives as platforms to magnify the name of Jesus. We understand that. And the beauty of following Christ, as we're going to see in the text that we're going to read here uh, tonight, is that we get the opportunity uh, to see things in the world that are contrary to human nature. We're able to see these things and learn that the despised things of the world are actually teachers uh, to followers of Christ as to how to walk with him in the midst of these things. In our text tonight, Jesus is going to speak very clearly um, about poverty. He's going to speak to us about hunger. He's going to speak about sorrow. He's going to speak about rejection. And in the midst of all of these things, the Lord is going to say, blessed are you. And this is a realization that human nature does not bring us to. It takes a person walking with Christ to see these things like poverty, hunger, sorrow, and rejection as fertile soil for a deepening faith. The world does not embrace these things as a state of happiness. The world would not look at someone in deep poverty or someone that is uh, destitute, someone that is sorrowing beyond measure, someone that has been rejected. The world wouldn't see all of that as something beautiful. The world wouldn't look at you and say, oh, you're well off. Conditions like this that Jesus speaks of in Luke chapter 6, conditions that the world would say, oh, I feel sorry for you or oh, that's so unfortunate, or, um, you know, that's just an inferior state. Jesus says to his disciples, these type conditions are necessary for y'all, for us, uh, to learn just how blessed they, the disciples of old, and we here today, how we really are. So church tonight, perhaps your unfortunate state your difficult experience. Perhaps God is speaking to you or is going to speak to you tonight through the text and he's going to say, this is just fertile soil for you to follow me in spite of and to realize how blessed you are because of these things. You have me. You have a walk with me that these conditions and these experiences cannot eradicate. It is the despised things of the world like poverty, hunger, sorrow, rejection that Jesus embraces and says to his followers, says to you and me, when you're experiencing these realities, you must see, you can see, you will be beneficial if you see that you really are well off that you can truly be happy in the midst of all these things. Let's read Luke 20 verses, uh, Luke chapter 6, verses 20 through 23. Jesus, turning his gaze toward his disciples, began to say to them, Blessed are you when you are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. 
Blessed are you who hunger now, for you shall be satisfied. Blessed are you who weep now, for you shall laugh. Blessed are you when men hate you and ostracize you and insult you and scorn your name as evil for the sake of the Son of Man. In verse 23, be glad in that day and leap for joy. For behold, your reward is great in heaven. For the same way their fathers used to treat the prophets. Four times in three verses, Jesus tells his disciples, blessed are you you. Fortunate are you. Well off are you. Happy are you in these states, in the state or the condition of poverty, in the state or condition of hunger. When people reject you, when you are sorrowing beyond sorrow, blessed are you. Now there are two dimensions um, to these text, to this text. Uh, to the terms poor, to the term hungering and sorrowing, and when men hate you and do all of these other sorts of things against you. There's certainly an internal spiritual condition, the internal state of the soul, how important it is to recognize yourself as empty and being in need of God, of absolutely having no resources whatsoever to create or foster a right standing with God, that you need God and what he has done for you and me on the cross and his son. The spiritual condition of being hungry for the things of God, thirsting for righteousness. Uh, we understand that there is a spiritual condition of sorrow, of being broken over our sin um, and weeping over the things that we have done wrong. And then the condition of loving the praises of God more than the praises of men. So it doesn't really matter what men do to you. And I understand that that is an important part of this text. But I would like to focus on the second dimension. The physical realities that unfortunate, as the world might say, it, or despised conditions that we as believers may find ourselves in are truly, truly fertile grounds by which we can learn to follow Christ and that we can have our eyes open in the midst of contrary physical conditions to see that we are really well off because of Jesus. Poverty has a way of teaching us that seeking the kingdom of heaven and his righteousness is all that we really need to do. We need to set our sights on not necessarily having our needs met, but Jesus says, if you seek the kingdom of heaven and all his righteousness, all these things shall be what? Added unto you. And church, this is encouraging because it gives us great hope to realize that fullness comes in Christ, not in our conditions. Hunger, truly hunger, uh, Hunger can teach us that we do not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. This is true satisfaction. The, the words of Scripture, the words of our Lord, actually become uh, nuggets of satisfaction to the soul. And so when we find ourselves in that state where we are hungry in some sort of way, where we feel like we are empty in some sort of way, the word of God will fill us that will bring us to a place of complete peace and again, fullness. Sorrow can teach the, when, when we're brokenhearted, can teach the follower of Christ how to be broken. Um, that when we are, are broken, realizing that Psalm 34, 18, that Christ is near to us when we are broken. He hasn't left us. We're not broken because of him. As we're broken, we learn to know him and to experience him be all, all knowledge. And when we're broken, we can learn that weeping truly does last for the night, but there is a joy that will come in the morning, meaning that we may go through a season of brokenness, we may go through a season of where our spirit is just downtrodden. But in the midst of that, we know that it is just a season 
we are learning to experience Christ's nearness and that there will be a season where joy will follow. And so as Jesus looks right there on those three things, he says, you are blessed. You are well off. You should consider yourself fortunate because now you have the opportunity in conditions that the world may say are despised, are unfavorable, are, are unwanted, are inferior. Jesus is saying, you can see that I truly am all that you ever need. Trust me, follow me in this. This is your teacher. This is your schoolmaster. And church, this is something that I greatly want to continue to experience for as long as the Lord gives me breath of following Christ in spite of my circumstances and seeing that it is because of my circumstances that my faith walk is enriched, not in spite of them, but because of my circumstances, my faith walk is enriched. Our text tonight, uh, particularly in verses 23 through 23, are words that in some way I believe that we all have experienced in a physical way to some degree when Jesus says blessed are you when men hate you and people ostracize you and insult you and scorn your name as evil for the sake of the son of man this is rejection this is being treated as if we are worthless and rejection does teach the follower of Christ how important it is to live for the praises of God and not the praises of men. This is something that is so hard because I believe the um, tangible nature of physical relationships, of sharing time and space with other people, and to be cast out by certain people or unwanted or pushed away, uh, particularly this is happening to you because of your commitment to Christ or this is happening to you because of someone else's obsession with sin um, in whatever way. If you are experiencing uh, rejection or feelings of worthlessness, Christ says, blessed are you. So men will hate you. Men will ostracize you. Men will insult you. Men will treat you like you are worthless, scorning your name as evil, the text says in verse 22. However, Christ says, blessed are you. Ponder that for a moment. Ponder if you find yourself in a situation where you have been made to feel worthless, where you have been cast out, where you've been pushed off. Maybe this has really happened to you. Maybe you've projected this upon yourself. Either way, feelings of rejection and viewing yourself as worthless is hurtful and damaging. But our Lord speaks into these situations and he says, Blessed are you. He says that in verse 20, verse 21, and then he says it again in verse 22. Blessed are you. Well off. How can a follower of Christ learn to live for the praises of God if we are always being accoladed or accepted by our peers, by our family, by people in our world? How can we, if we're well-loved, if we're well-liked, if we're well-appreciated, if we're well-accepted, if people are always beating our drum, clapping for us, telling us how good we are, how can we truly learn to live for the praises of God over the praises of men when we are getting what we need to some degree from the accolades of man? You find yourself in a good place tonight, church member, friend, someone who may have just stumbled into this teaching, um, looking for an online Bible study, looking for a church service online, for God to tell you that the rejection of people is the will of God for your life and my life so that we can learn the beauty of living for his praise. 
understand that God is worthy to be praised regardless of how people treat us. God is worthy to be praised regardless of how people treat us. We cannot give men the power, the influence, or the ability to blind us to the beauty of God because they're mistreating us, they're insulting us, they're ostracizing us, they're treating us like we're worthless. Those things cannot blind us. We can't allow those things to blind us to the praise of God. You are in Christ. Men's actions do not change the reality that blessed are you. We have to allow these experiences of rejection, ostracization, if you will, feelings of worthlessness, being treated like the filth of the earth is. Uh, the New Testament writers say that the apostles were the dregs of the earth. That is the dirt on the dirt, the dirt wiped off, worthless, horrible. They understood that living for the praise of God was their number one goal. And so following Christ results in hostilities from others. Uh, verse 22 makes this very clear. And this should not trip us up. Jesus himself experienced hostilities for his faithful obedience to his Father's will. I'm reminded of the words in Matthew 10, 24, when it says a disciple, that is you and me, a follower of Christ, a student of Christ, a learner of his character, a learner of his teachings. Uh, we are not above him, nor we his servants are we above our master. Think about this. The text addresses in verse 22, men hating, men ostracizing, men insulting, you can look at it there, and men casting your name off as evil, scorning you, treating you as worthless. All four of these aspects of mistreatment, Jesus clearly experienced. He walked this road. He understands and understood clearly what it felt like to be hated, ostracized, insulted, and treated as worthless. Work with me, if you will, in your thoughts through a few pages or uh, passages in the pages of Scripture. Um, in Luke chapter 4, verses 28 through 29, the Bible says, When they heard this, the people in the synagogue were furious. Jumping up, they mobbed Jesus and forced him to the edge of the hill on which the town was built. They intended to push him over the cliff. Now, I don't understand um, exactly uh, what your thought process is about intentionally trying to push someone over a cliff, but that would lead to his death. Uh, pushing someone over a cliff is not a good thing. It's not, oh, hey, you know, I really love you. Let me push you over the cliff. There was hatred in the heart of these people in Jesus' hometown, so much so that they wanted to push him over the cliff. They did not like what he said. They didn't like what he stood for. They didn't like who he was. And so they intended to hurt him out of hatred. The Bible tells us in Mark chapter 5, verse 17, uh, after Jesus had cast the demons into the swine and they had, had uh, ran off the cliff there, the crowd began pleading with Jesus to go away and leave them alone. They didn't want Jesus in their presence. They pushed him away. They wanted to ostracize him. Get, don't fellowship with us. Don't come into our region. Uh, now that you have, get out. Get away. You think about the good thing that Jesus did there for that man in, in the text by freeing him from those oppressive spirits. And then the people seeing that this man was freed from oppressive spirits by the hand of Jesus, and they still not wanting him. You may find yourself wondering, why do people reject you? Why do people not want you around? Friend, it's not about the people. It's truly not. It's about what God is trying to teach you and me about having a confident trust in him where his evaluation of us is all that matters. 
In Matthew chapter 10, verse 25, Jesus was insulted. Uh, the Bible says students are to be like their teacher and slaves are to be like their master. I read a portion of that earlier uh, in verse 24. Uh, and since I, Jesus says, the master of my household, that is my followers, my body, have been called the prince of demons or Beelzebub, the members of my household will be called by even worse names. Jesus was mocked and name called. He continued to persist in the will of his fathers. These insults did not break his desire to submit and to accomplish the plans of heaven. And so today, as I just read this and I'm talking into this camera, I'm finding great encouragement. Today, we need to be reminded that we cannot fall to pieces. We don't have to fall to pieces when we are insulted, ostracized, and hated. We can embrace our Lord. Jesus was clearly treated as worthless. I think of uh, the passion narratives, particularly in John chapter 19. Uh, we find these words in verses 1 through 3. Then Pilate had Jesus flogged with a lead-tipped whip. The soldiers wove a crown of thorns and put it on his head, and they put a purple robe on him. See the imagery. See the pain. See the mocking. Hell, king of the Jews. They mocked as they slapped him across the face. This was physical. This was dirty dog treatment. This was hostility to a great degree, treating the king of glory as if he was nothing. You know, sometimes we have the tendency to say, you know, people don't respect me. Listen, that may be true. People may not respect you. But why is it so important? Why is it important for you and me to feel respected, to be respected I submit to you tonight there is one problem and one problem alone that we have now listen this doesn't take away the fact where the text in other places teach the importance of respecting people this is no way a license that we should be disrespectful or people have the right to be disrespectful to us I'm talking about why are we shaken why do we become discouraged why do we become angry when we do not receive respect, when we are cast off and treated as worthless. And I would submit to you one problem. The praises of God do not mean more to us than the acceptance or the approval of men. We have not yet learned in our sojourn as we follow Christ, and I'm hoping that somehow this homily to uh, night in this uh, text will help you to see the importance that we can learn to find great satisfaction in being accepted and embraced and welcomed by God that we truly are blessed that we truly are well off because of who Jesus is because we have learned in the most inferior or unwelcoming of circumstances of being rejected and well treated and ill treated that Jesus is our all in all. This is not platitude. Uh, this is not posturing. This is one man being given the opportunity by our pastor to lead a Bible study to challenge our people to realize that following Christ will it result in the experience of great hostilities from others. But it is because of that hostility that you and I can learn the beauty of Christ and that he is worthy to be praised and that he is all that we ever need. Following Christ, as we see in verse 23, results in spiritual growth. He says, be glad in that day and leap for joy. An honest response for those of us not fully initiated and, and callous to these words. Oh yeah, we, we understand that. But an honest response, first glance of these words, reading it in context, has to be, are you kidding me? Be glad you poor. Be glad you who are hungry. Be glad you who are weeping. Be glad you who are insulted by others, ostracized, scorned, 
hated, treated as worthless. Be glad. Are you kidding me? No. He's speaking something. You can only be glad because being glad is as much an internal state as it is an external state. It starts in the heart. Spiritually maturing believers choose to rejoice because they understood what we said earlier. God is worthy to be praised in the midst of hostilities, in the midst of unfortunate circumstances, in the midst of what the world calls not good. God is worthy to be praised. And it takes a mature follower person that has submitted themselves to the Spirit's control and the teaching of the Word to be able to be glad internally, to be at peace internally, to be confident and to know that you are accepted in Christ. Spiritually maturing followers will bear fruit. That is the leaping for joy. This is an external action followed by that internal transformation of where you can be glad. He says, in that day, uh, be glad in that day and leap for joy. In that day, in that season, in that time frame, in that experience, and in that period of life, be glad when you are hated, ostracized, insulted, and treated as worthless. And Jesus modeled this. Jesus modeled this in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2. Fixing your eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith, who for the joy set before him, he, he endured the cross, despised the shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God, despising the shame, meaning not to accept shame for the ill way that he was treated, not to embrace that he was a lesser, or that he was um, a shameful type action that he took. He despised the shame. He rejected the shame. He didn't embrace shame. He didn't own shame because of what others had done to him, what you had done to him, what I had done to him. We put him on the cross. He modeled joy for the joy set before him to set those free who he had died for, who he had suffered for. One of the greatest things that we can remember is that vengeance is the Lord's. He says these things. I'll talk about that from Psalm 109 in the next teaching uh, that you'll have on Wednesday night, uh, the 21st of October. But realizing that vengeance is the Lord's and choosing to see that when we walk in the spirit and we walk in truth, we can actually give a portrait of Christ to our insulters, to our rejectors, to those who mistreat us that they would never get, that they would never get. Spiritually maturing followers embrace hope. Notice what he says in verse 23. He says, for behold, that is see, embrace, behold, own it, live it, walk in it, live like it's true. For behold, your reward is great in heaven. That's why they bear fruit. That's why they choose to rejoice. Their eye is on the king of kings. Their eye is on the glory of heaven. Their eye is on the beauty of being blessed and favored by Christ. And that's what we need to do today as a result tonight, as a result of this teaching. Spiritually mature believers, followers of Christ will always embrace the fact that we are not walking this road alone. Notice what he says, verse 23. Understand this. In the same way their fathers used to treat the prophets, we're not victims. We are not victims. Everyone who seeks to live godly in Christ Jesus in this life will face troubles, trials, and difficulties, hostilities. Everyone will know what distress is. We are not alone. The fathers did the same thing, the Jewish 
elders did the same things to the prophets, Jesus says. If you are a disciple of mine, men will insult you, mock you, ostracize you, hate you, treat you as worthless. Know that you are blessed, Jesus says, because of him, because of me, Jesus says. Jesus Christ, we're blessed because of him. Tonight, today, whenever you're listening to this, my encouragement is follow Christ. Realize that we are in this together and that because of whatever plight and difficulty you are facing, Jesus Christ has still said you are blessed because of whatever plight or difficulty you and I are facing. Because of that, we can come more devoted, faithful followers because we walk in the Spirit and just think of what that will do to our witness. God bless you. Be encouraged. Thank you for taking the time to um, join in this teaching. A great text that I'm sure one day, Pastor or someone else, uh, will get up and, and address the other side of the coin uh, as it relates to uh, the spiritual significance of, of poverty and hunger and sorrow and being rejected, the uh, spiritual condition of the soul for a walk with Christ. But my prayer is that this practical portion of looking at the physical side of these things in relationship to our dependence on Christ will somehow have nourished and encouraged you. All right. God bless y'all. We look forward to seeing you in the sanctuary soon. Keep Brother Jackie in prayer as he's taking a little bit of time away. He and Miss Denise, we have a wonderful pastor. And let's let him know that by committing ourselves to hold him up to our Father.